Okay, what does it say in Hebrew over there? Shabbat Shalom, that's right. And what is the Torah portion today? Can anybody read that? Akre Mot, which means after the death. Who died? Can you imagine? It's the grand opening ceremony of Moses' tabernacle on Nisan 1. Aaron is the high priest. It's the most wonderful day of his life. And then his two sons get killed. The Lord destroys them by fire for offering strange incense. I think that probably put a little dampener on the grand and glorious opening day ceremony. Uh, you know, but what's interesting is they were practicing the Day of Atonement rituals. That's what they're practicing. And uh, it's all about finding forgiveness. That's what the Day of Atonement is about and how to draw near to God without dying. And the first thing we find out is how to draw near to God and die, <laughs> okay? Don't want to do that. We need to learn from that. Here we see in Leviticus chapter 16, verse 1, the Lord told Moses, after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they drew near before the Lord and died. Uh, you know, uh, in Romans, I believe, and in James, it talks about drawing near to God. We're supposed to draw near to God. All right? We can draw near to God. But that doesn't mean you don't have to follow protocols. If you don't follow protocols, you will die. So God is showing us how we can draw near to him. Uh, you know, Aaron, both his sons, they brought incense wanting to draw near to God. What's wrong with that? Well, if you look in the New Testament at Hebrews 10, 31, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We, sometimes we get too familiar with God. We get too cozy with God. We keep him in our pocket. We pull Jesus out, you know, hey, you know. My gosh, I, I found out about this the other day. I was talking, I won't say who, but to an actual FBI agent uh, whose job is to uncover terrorism that's going around in the United States. And he told me that the cartel Everywhere they go in and they bust a big cartel group, the leaders and a lot of the people will have a little relic in their pocket that represents the fact that they're covered by the blood. They don't have to worry. They'll be forgiven. Every one of these cartel people, they carry this little thing in their pocket that assures them in their mind that they'll go to heaven because they're forgiven before they kill somebody. Yeah, and it's got uh, like an Asherah as part of the thing. You know, I grew up Catholic for 19 years. You know, we've, we were taught basically if you wear a scapular, you're guaranteed to go to heaven, you know. But the reason why is you can sit all you want, but you're guaranteed to have a priest at your deathbed hear your confession, so you're good. You know, they have, uh, yeah, but anyway, aside from that, look at Hebrews 4, 14 through 16. Having been a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Yeshua, the Son of God, let's hold tightly to our confession. We don't have a high priest who can't be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but he's been in all points tempted like we are, yet without sin. And then it says, therefore, let us draw near with boldness to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and may find grace for help in the time of need. <clears throat> now notice, it says boldly. It doesn't say stupidly. Big difference, okay? Uh, how many of you know if you work with electricity, you better follow some protocols? Okay, let's look at Leviticus 16 too. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron your brother that he doesn't come at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat. Okay, he can only come into the veil where the mercy seat is once a year on Yom Kippur. I think his two sons went right into behind the veil where the mercy seat was. Well, you're thinking, I'm at the mercy seat. Why am I dying? God has protocols. And it says, which is on the ark, that he die not because I will appear in the cloud on the mercy seat. God is on the mercy seat. And so we should have mercy. But even Aaron can't go willy nilly in there anytime he wants. It's only one time a year. There are rules. Look at Leviticus 16, 4. 
and I have a little picture here. Can you imagine wearing all white and you're slaughtering animals, blood going everywhere? Can you imagine what your white garment is going to look like? And it says here that he put on the holy linen coat. He has on linen breeches. He has a linen girdle, a linen turban. And they're holy garments, and he has to wash his flesh in water and then put them on. On Yom Kippur, it's the only day when everyone wears white, okay? And we know white and linen speaks of the righteousness of the saints. That's the whole point, okay? So what do we see in Leviticus 16, 8 through 10? Then... Aaron has these two goats he casts lots on. One lot is for the Lord. The other one is for the scapegoat. And then Aaron brings the goat on which the Lord's lot fell, and he offers them for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat has to be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement with him and let him go for a scapegoat in the wilderness. Okay, so this is important to understand. Uh, one of the things I want to mention is that in ancient times, they would tie a red sash around the horn of the goat when they sent him off into the wilderness, and they would tie a red sash around the doors of the temple. And after, uh, how many of you would like to have all the sins of Israel brought to your town? No, well, that's a problem. All the other people were saying, good grief, here comes all their sins, get them out of here. And they send the goat back. Well, they don't want them to come back, so they decided to throw them over a cliff. And so every year after Yom Kippur, they would take the scapegoat way out into the wilderness and they literally would throw the goat over the cliff so it wouldn't go anywhere and it would die. But when that happened, the red sash on the doors of the temple turned white. And from Isaiah, uh, I think 118, well, though your sins be as crimson, they will be as white as wool. Okay, that's lambskin or uh, from a lamb. Uh, and so that happened until 30 AD when Yeshua died. From then on, it never turned white, which is kind of an fasc uh, interesting, fascinating historical thing. Okay, <clears throat> now, some people think the scapegoat is Satan. That's stupid, uh, just so you know. Sorry, guys, if I believe that way. Uh, let's look at Leviticus 16, 11 through 14. Okay, I'm going to give you another picture of inside the holy place where the mercy seat is, which is the copper rot. And let's look at what it says. <clears throat> Let me see. <laughs> okay, Aaron shall bring the bull of the sin offering, and it's for who? Himself. Only himself. It's not for anybody else. And he makes atonement for himself. By doing atonement for himself and for his house, okay, then he can do atonement for the rest of the people. It says he will take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar and his hands full of sweet incense beaten small and he brings it within the veil so in this picture on the floor uh, you see the incense now what i want you to follow is put these in your mind so you don't forget this what does he do on yom kippur he takes a censer full of incense of, of uh, burning coals from off the altar and his hands of full sweet incense and so he takes the incense and he pours it on the burning coals Everyone following me? Now, you have to remember, Moses made the tabernacle. It was patterned after one in heaven. There's a heavenly tabernacle. They're down here. And while he is doing Yom Kippur on earth, there's a Yom Kippur ceremony going on in heaven. That's what you have to understand. It's modeled after that. They're doing Yom Kippur in the heaven at one level. And we're doing Yom Kippur on earth at another level. And so we, we see... Because he's taking a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, that's what an angel in heaven is doing at the very same time. Are you getting the picture? Okay. And then it says, he puts the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that's on the testimony that he doesn't die. And then he takes the blood of the bull and he sprinkles it with his finger on the mercy seat east. And before the mercy seat, will he sprinkle with the blood on his finger, how many times? Okay, so you see in this picture, the high priest, all in white, he's dripping blood on the altar seven times. Right? Does everybody see that? Okay, now, what's interesting 
is you take the word kaparot, which is the mercy seat, and you add it up, you get 700. I think that's kind of fascinating for mercy. But look at this. As I always say, but wait, there's more. Okay, I will prove to you that it's going on in heaven while it's going down on earth. Look at Revelation now, chapter 8, verse 2 through 5. He sees seven angels standing before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And then another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer. There was given to him much incense, that he had offered it with the prayers of all the saints upon the altar, which was before the throne. The incense represents the prayers of the saints. Okay, so there's something that's going on in heaven at the very moment is going down on earth and it says the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended before God out of the angel's hand. The angel took the censer, filled it with the fire, where? From the altar. But what does he do? He cast it to the earth and there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. When you understand the connections, you know this event will happen some year on Yom Kippur. And if you're not on God's calendar and don't know when Yom Kippur is, you won't know that this verse has been fulfilled. This is why we have to be on God's calendar. Look at Revelation 11, 18, and 19. Now, we just got done reading. How often can he go in and look at the ark? Once a year, and it is on when? Well, look at Revelation 11, 18, and 19. The nations were angry. Your wrath is come. The time of the dead that they should be judged. And you should give reward to your servants, the prophets, to the saints and them that fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who are destroying the earth. The temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. There was lightning and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. This is Yom Kippur. When you understand the biblical calendar and you connect to the Hebraic roots, not only do you understand Revelation, you know when the events are going to happen. Let's look at Leviticus 16, 17. There is to be nobody in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goes in to make atonement until he comes out and has made an atonement for himself, his household, and all the congregation of Israel. Did you notice the nations were not listed? Why? Yom Kippur is only for the nation of Israel. That's it. The Day of Atonement is only for Israel. They were to be kings and priests. And then the Feast of Tabernacles, five days later, that's atonement for the nations. That's what it was. They had, just like Aaron had to make atonement before himself, for himself before he could Israel, Israel had to take atonement for themselves before they could make atonement for the nations. In Genesis, there were 70 nations. And during Tabernacles, they killed 70 bulls, one for each nation. But how many people could be in there with him? And this is in Leviticus. We'll look at Revelation 15, 6 through 8. The seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and what? White linen. When do they wear white linen? Yom Kippur. Having their breasts girded with golden girdles, one of the four beasts gave to the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who lived forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one was able to enter into the temple. Why? It's a Yom Kippur event. Are you catching it? When you read Revelation, you know, you don't know the year, but you know when the events happen because they'll be fulfilled on the exact days. In Zechariah 8, 19, it mentions four fast days. They're going to be turned into feast days, the fast of the seventh month. Well, if you don't know when that is, how, how are you going to know that the prophecy is fulfilled? Okay, look at Leviticus 16, 30. It says, for on that day, the priest will make atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord, and it's to be a Sabbath of rest to you, and you will afflict your souls by a statute forever. Okay, there's two things that are happening here. Atonement and, or covering, to cover and to cleanse. God covers you, and then he cleanses you. Seven times we hear of the covering. The copperette is the covering of the mercy seat. God wants to cover you. I got you covered Okay, putting you under the shadow of his wings. So on Yom Kippur, we become enveloped by God himself 
who is, we're like inside the washing machine, <laughs> okay? And he's purifying us. He's cleansing us. Here's what we need to understand. Forgiveness does not just come out of the blue. Okay, be forgiven. It doesn't work that way. God doesn't wave a magic wand. The only way we get cleansed is by coming in contact with God. He cleanses us, okay? Even, now this is, this is gonna be shocking, so buckle your seatbelts. Even when we repent and let go of our sins, we are still dirtied by our actions, and so we need the washing of the word. Yeshua is the word. To get clean, you have to go into the washing machine. A covering as a child in the womb is covered, okay? Uh, it's being as pure as a newborn child. So Yom Kippur is first and foremost about closeness to God, and it's the closeness to God the result of coming in contact with him. And then secondly comes the forgiveness and cleansing as a result. Now, I'm gonna to tie together some uh, more interesting things. Uh, let's see, but as I said, here you have an angel in heaven taking incense from the altar. This is in Revelation. And here we got to reading about it in Leviticus. But look at Revelation 6.10, here, they cry with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, do you not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Okay, so here, these are saints under the altar that are crying out to God. Will you please judge and avenge our blood, right? Well, look at Deuteronomy 32, 40 through 44. This is where it comes from. And Deuteronomy 32 is like the revelation section of the whole Torah. God says, if I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever, and then he says, I'm going to sharpen my glittering sword, my hand will take a hold on judgment, and he says, I will render vengeance to my enemies, I will reward those that hate me, I will make my arrows drunk with blood, my sword will devour flesh, and that with the blood of the slain and of the captives from the beginning of revenges on the enemy, and then it tells the nations of the world to rejoice with Israel because he will avenge the blood of his servants. This is why in Revelation, they're crying out, well, when? Okay, he'll render vengeance to his adversaries, but he'll be merciful to his land and to his people. This is Israel, the Jewish people. Okay, well, here we just got done reading. He's gonna wet his glittering sword and render vengeance. That's why under the altar, they're crying out, what is the day of vengeance? Yom Kippur. Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, Tishri 1 through 10, is when everyone appears before God. It's the opening of the books, the heavenly courts in session. Yom Kippur, the books are closed, and judgment is meted out. And so what do we see in Revelation 19, 15? Out of his mouth goes what? A sharp sword that he can smite the nations and rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the wine press. That is the grape harvest. Hello, this is going to happen during the grape harvest, which is September, October, Tishri. And then it says, uh, he has on his clothing and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds of the air that are flying in the heavens, Come and gather yourselves to the supper of the great God, that you can eat the flesh of kings, captains, flesh of mighty men, horses, and of them that sit on them, the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Wow, this is the great supper. Guess what? Everyone is going to be able to make it to the wedding supper. Some will eat and some will be eaten. You decide what side of the table you want to be on. Okay. Now, look at Hebrews 4, 12. The word of God is living and active, and it's sharper than any sword. That's why the sword comes out of his mouth from the word of God. Look at Revelation 19, 2. It finally happens. True and righteous are his judgments. And this also comes from Deuteronomy 32, in case you didn't know. He judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication. And he finally has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. All right. Now let's look at Leviticus 1715. Oh, and guess what? I have this picture of Messiah coming 
and they're all on white horses dressed in white, is what it says. Why? It's Yom Kippur. That's when everyone wears white. I mean, when you understand the concepts, the old Bible all of a sudden becomes in color, 3D, and everything comes together. But now we're going to shift for just a little bit here. Leviticus 17.50. He's talking about what they can eat, what they can't eat. And if you think about it, in the Garden of Eden, from the very beginning, the first law was what you put in your mouth. It's always been about what you consume. You are what you eat. Okay, and he says, every soul that eats that which died of itself, okay, we know beef is kosher, but if the cow gets old and just dies on its own, or maybe it got torn apart by a lion's, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger, he shall both wash his clothes, bathe himself in water, and he's unclean until even, then he shall be clean. Wow, so even eating kosher food that didn't, uh, that just died on its own, you're not to eat it. As a matter of fact, look at Leviticus 18, one through five. The Lord says to Moses, speak to the children of Israel, say to them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt where you dwelt, I don't want you to do that. After the doings of the land of Canaan where I bring you, I don't want you to do what they do either. Okay, don't walk in their ways. He says, I want you to do my judgments, and if you keep my ordinances, then, and you walk that way, I'm the Lord your God, you will therefore keep my statutes, my judgments, which if a man do, he will what? Live. Okay, how many of you think God is bipolar? Okay, or schizophrenic, or a liar? Then why would he say, if you keep my commandments, statutes, and judgments, you'll live, and yet today everyone says, they'll kill you. All that law is done away with is just here to kill you. Well, no, wait a minute. You can't say, this is what they said when they left Egypt. God, you brought us out to kill us. Rather than, God, thank you for these wonderful ways to keep us safe. God says, don't stick your fingers in a blender when it's running. And then we stick our fingers in a blender. Why, God, why did that happen? Are you stupid? You know. Okay. But we'll live if we follow his commandments. They don't kill us. Look at Leviticus 18, 26 through 28. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and you shall not commit any of these abominations, neither any of you of your own nation, nor a stranger that lives in the land, because of all the abominations have the men of the land done, which were before you, and so the land's defiled. And look what it says. If you do... Well, the land will spew not you out also when you defile it as it spewed out the nations that were before you. In other words, the land almost is a breathing place. It vomited out the nations because of their abominations. God gave it to Israel. They repeated the abominations and the land vomited Israel out for the last 2,000 years. Okay, <clears throat> so now here's... Um, Something else I just want to bring up. This is 1 Samuel. I believe that's our Haftor portion. Yeah, 1 Samuel 20, uh, verse 18. Jonathan is speaking to David, saying, Tomorrow's the new moon. It will see that you aren't there. Okay, they would keep the new moon. This is why we have the calendar, so you could understand what the new moon is all about. Uh, and, and it's good to have a good understanding. And uh, every new moon, we have a, on our internet, on our website, the teaching of how every tribe was assigned to one of those months. And so you know exactly what the, each month uh, was about. Um, let's see. I'm going to have to jump. Let's see. I'm going to. So anyway, I'm just because of time. Let's jump down. Let's see. To Matthew 15, 10 through 12. Let me see where I'm at. Okay. Uh, here it says, he calls a multitude and he said, hear and understand, it's not what goes in the mouth that defiles someone, but that which comes out of the mouth. Then came his disciples and he said, do you know the Pharisees were offended? How many of you know God, Yeshua did not care if he offended them? <laughs> okay. He wasn't politically correct. Uh, we need to stand for what is right. And obviously we know it's not what comes into us that's so important as much as what comes out of us. How many of you remember my story of the coffee in the cup when you're driving? Some of you do, some of you don't. 
I'll close with this little story. <clears throat> How many of you have ever been driving and you have a cup of coffee in your car and all of a sudden you slam on your brakes and the cup tips over and coffee goes everywhere in your car? Ever happened to anyone? Come on, tell the truth. We're all human. My question is, why did coffee spill out of the cup? Well, you're going fast, you step on the brakes, it's called the laws of physics, right? Wrong. I did not ask why did the cup tip over. I asked why did coffee spill out of the cup? It spilled out of the cup because there was coffee in the cup. What is the moral of this story? God will tip us over in our walk so we can see what's inside that comes out that we didn't realize was there. That's what God does. He's tipping us over and we wonder, God, why did you tip me over? And then all of a sudden realize, ooh, so I can see that was in there. Okay? So God has ordained our life so we constantly tip because we don't know what's inside of us until it comes out. And so that is the story of our lives. With that said, let's stand. We're going to say a prayer. We're going to have a break. We're going to have worship. And then we're going to come back and we're going to turn it over to our guest speakers. Yay. Avinu Malkeno, our Father King, we just thank you so much that we can come together and worship you. And I just pray you give us seeing eyes, hearing ears, a heart to understand what you're speaking to us for our day. Lord, I want to thank you for all those who give uh, any tithes or offerings toward your ministry. It's not our ministry. It's your ministry, bringing the light of the Torah to all the nations of the world. And uh, we just pray so much, Lord, that you would truly bless your people, uh, not necessarily financially, but with the knowledge of knowing you, as you say in your word, let him that glorieth glory in this, that he knows and understands me. We pray for a blessing that you would fill us with the knowledge and the understanding of you. That's worth more than all the treasures of the world. In Yeshua's name, amen. Together, blessed are you, Lord our God, creator and king of the universe. You have blessed us with your Torah of truth. You have blessed us with the whole counsel of your living word by the power of your Holy Spirit. Through the completed work of Messiah Yeshua, you alone have planted among us life eternal. Blessed are you, Lord our God. Amen. Take a break.